Hello, hello. I've got my friend Andy Storch joining me on the show today. He's an author, facilitator, keynote speaker, and a podcast host. His latest book, Own Your Career, Own Your Life, speaks exactly to the uncaged mission. It lights me up inside. It's this idea where we can't let our career or our job happen to us, but we happen to it. We own our career so that we can own our life, create the lifestyle we want, create the freedom in our world, and we have to take ownership of it. We can't just accept what's given. So that's what I love, what's at the core of that book and his message that he's getting out to hundreds and thousands of people at this point. To the point idea of owning your career, he shares his story on battling cancer recently, just after the book launched, what he went through. And it's really vulnerable and it's really packed with wisdom on how to think about life priorities. And I also love how he brought his atypical ideas for career and life and actually applied that to his cancer treatment. He challenged conventional wisdom and now he's in a great place. So he shares that story with us. You can check out more from Andy at andystorch.com. We'll have links to his website, his offerings, his book, all in the show notes. Before we dive in, if you're getting value from Uncaged Yourself, I'd really appreciate if you jumped on over to Apple Podcasts and or Spotify and left a quick, honest review. It means the world to me, helps get the word out to people I hope to serve. All right, let's get to our interview with Andy. Enjoy. Growing up, society taught you to follow the script by choosing a career path and climbing the ladder. But for many people, this promise falls flat. Work suffocates them, and life becomes painful. Here, you're trapped in what I call the corporate cage. Fortunately, there's a way out. You can take control of your corporate job and unlock a life of freedom. I call this living uncaged. Hi, this is your host, Matt Doan. I'm a coach, creator, and entrepreneur. Uncaging people is my mission because it's been my exact life journey. This show provides you the stories, principles, and tactics to make it happen. Welcome to Uncage Yourself. Hey, Andy, welcome to Uncage Yourself. Matt, thank you so much for having me on. I really, really appreciate it. I love how aligned we are in so many things, and I'm excited to dive into this conversation. Uh, I feel like we're kindred spirits. I can't wait to share some things with the world and bring you to this audience. I've been loving your work for so long. So to get us moving, let's dive right in. How has your definition of success changed over the years? Yeah, I like this question because uh, I've certainly learned, as maybe you and others have, that the definition of success, the idea of success is very personal. It's very um, you know, it changes with different people and, and different phases of your life. So early on in my career, uh, if you asked me what success was, uh, I probably would have said something about a title or money. Right. And, um, you know, when I was in my twenties and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do or what I was going to do with my career, uh, no matter what it was, like I had this vision of like, well, I wanted to get somewhere and, and move up the ladder, you know, and be a vice president or a CEO one day or a politician or somebody with like a lot of respect and admiration, right? That's what success is. And hopefully that comes with making a lot of money as well. Um, as I've gone on in my life and gotten older and experienced a lot of things, I've realized that success now for me is really just being happy, right? Are you happy with your life? Are you fulfilled? Are you satisfied? Um, I said in the past that, uh, it's almost like living life with no regrets, but I know you did an episode recently on, uh, the idea of living with no regrets and that, uh, it's natural to have regrets. So we won't say it's living life with no regrets, but, um, I think it's really, it's feeling happy and satisfied with your life. And that doesn't mean that you are completely, so I shouldn't say satisfied, being happy and fulfilled with your life. It doesn't mean you're completely satisfied, right? Because we are ambitious people and maybe you have big goals and you want to achieve more, but you feel like you're making progress towards that. You're taking action, spending time in the right place. Um, you know, you're grateful for the things you have and the opportunities in front of you. Um, I say you, I mean me. So being happy and fulfilled and grateful, I would say is, uh, successful for me. That's beautiful. Let me give you a quick follow on here. And this is not a leading question. I don't have an answer. It's how much is happiness dependent on external circumstances? Mm, I think 
most people in the world place a lot of weight on external circumstances um, to drive their happiness or they derive happiness from external circumstances uh, and often wait to be happy. Say things like, I'll be happy when I get that promotion. I'll be happy when I pay off my debt. I'll be happy when you know my, I'm in a relationship or whatever it may be. And I think a lot of people don't realize that we can choose to be happy right now, right? You can choose to be happy in your life today. It doesn't mean that you are completely satisfied again with your situation. Many people have many challenges in front of them, whether it be health or relationship or career challenges, things that are going on that you just don't like. Uh, but I think you can own your situation. You can deal with those things and you can still choose to be happy and fulfilled right now and figure out what might make you happier and, and take action towards that. Um, but I think happiness at the end of the day is really more intrinsic than extrinsic. And it comes from your mindset. You know, how, what is your outlook of the world? What do you, how do you see things? And if you choose to believe the world is great and your life is great, then you can choose to be happy and you can choose the opposite as well. Hmm. I love that you said that. You actually just captured a sentiment in a book I was reading recently, The Untethered Soul. I don't know if you've read mm. this one before. Yeah. Um, the, the whole idea is that Yes, externals will affect us to some degree, but all the best we can do is in this moment, in this moment, in this moment, choose to be happy. And it's every moment is a decision to choose that. And you're giving yourself a much greater chance of feeling that and experiencing that if you consciously choose it every time you recall that it is mm -hmm. a choice, right? And then yeah. just think about how that compounds over a day, a month, a life. It's beautiful. And and a lot of it has to do with, I think, accepting the external uh things that are going on, right? And recognizing things that are outside of your control. So I like to talk about the idea of having an ownership mindset. I wrote a chapter about this in my book. And I think the sort of the core tenet to that is focusing your energy on things that are within your control and spending less energy on things that are outside of your control. And, you know, what's outside of your control, politics, the world economy, the weather, uh, what your boss decides to do, company leadership, your spouse, your kids, your pets, like, you, you know, there's an illusion that you might think you can control these things or people, but you really can't. Um, but what's in your control is how you respond to the things that happen, right? And how you show up and how you treat other people. And when you focus your energy on that, uh, I find I'm a lot happier and more fulfilled when I'm, you know, really taking ownership and focusing on the things that are within my control. Yeah. Yeah. I remember in reading that book of yours, which we'll have in the show notes, Own Your Career, Own Your Life. I, I read that, that ownership point and I thought of two things. I thought of Jocko Willink talking about extreme ownership. You need mm -hmm. to have complete ownership. And then also ancient stoicism, the whole idea of there's only so much that we can control. If you focus right. on controlling the controllable, life gets a lot easier because there's only a small amount of things That's you right. can do in your life that you can control. Right. Them. Cool. That's we right. could get very philosophical. We'll pivot that one from here. Thanks yep. for diving in. I'd like to just give a quick snapshot, Andy, if we could, for the audience on your backstory. And I like this ownership mentality, right? This, I think it has a, a good thread through your life. But if you could talk to us first, how did your childhood impact your career? If you could start there. Well, you know, I, I think I had like a, you know, fairly normal childhood, grew up in a, I would say middle-class household uh, here in Orlando, Florida, where I live again now. My parents were teachers. Uh, we certainly weren't rich, but we weren't poor. You know, we were fine. Um, you know, they taught me to really strive for greatness in academics and achieve and that I needed to go to college. Uh, my parents were divorced and my mom worked a lot. And I think they also taught me and the way I grew up taught me to, a lot of independence and that if I want something, I need to go out and, and kind of make it happen on my own. Uh, I spent a lot of time on my own. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that impacted my approach to the world, good and bad, because later on, I've become very independent where I could go out and do things on my own. At the same time, uh, I struggled for many years to accept help from other people because sometimes we get caught in that mentality. It's almost that ego that like, oh, I should be able to figure this out on my own. I don't need help. Uh, and what I've realized, of course, is that we achieve way more when we ask for and we accept help. And of course, we feel good when we help other people as well. Um, but I would say, you know, it set me up for success in some ways. In other ways, I grew up with a very fixed mindset. And of course, uh, I, I know you're big on mindset as well. In my book, I talk about, you know, growth mindset versus fixed mindset, uh, which comes from the book Mindset, the New Psychology of Success by Dr. Carol Dweck, Stanford professor. Um, I think I grew up with a very fixed mindset. And with a fixed mindset, you kind of believe that you're either good at something or you're not, you're smart or you're not. 
and I would achieve in some areas. But then when I would run into roadblocks, I would I would usually quit. I was so afraid of rejection and quitting or and failing um, that I walked away from a lot of opportunities. And even as I got into my 20s and I didn't know what I wanted to do, uh, I found that fear often held me back from uh, chasing after things that I might want to do, following my dreams, that sort of thing. And so since I've made the big, big shifts and pivots in my life later in my 30s in the last few years... Uh, one of those things that I've really gone into attack is how fear has held me back and to overcome that and develop that growth mindset and really try a lot more things. And so I think it's one of those situations lots of people can probably relate to where there are some things from my childhood that I think helped set me for, up for success and many other things that I really needed to overcome. And so I had to learn a lot of new things later in my life uh, in order to overcome a lot of the things that were holding me back from before. Wow. I could see that really <laughs> brought you to a tipping point in your career when you had this fixed mindset, these fears, and you wanted something more out of your life, but you didn't have yeah. the tool set at the time to be able to deal with it. Fast forward for a little bit for me. So you, you get into the career itself. Give me, give me the time and place essentially of where you're in the corporate world and you start to feel this challenge inside where it doesn't feel right anymore. Talk yeah. to me about that phase and what you were thinking and feeling. Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll back up and I'll take you to that point. So um, after I graduated in college, um, I discovered this idea of entrepreneurship after I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, which I'm sure you've read and, and many people out there in entrepreneur world. Um, that was their introduction. I had never heard of entrepreneurship before. My parents were, were teachers. Uh, everyone had a job in my family. Um, I, I don't think I knew any entrepreneurs other than my uncle uh, who lived in another state who had been a realtor and a salesperson and, and kind of done some entrepreneurial things here and there. But otherwise, I mean, I had no idea. And uh, that turned me on to, I said, oh, I want to, I want to be an entrepreneur, right? And um, my wife and I moved out to LA from Florida and uh, I ended up uh, going to work for a couple startups. I started a couple companies with friends uh, and they were all abysmal failures. I worked for some of the biggest jerks uh, that that walked the earth. Uh, and so I learned a lot about uh, poor leadership during that time. Um, but then I also started a couple of things that didn't work out either. And I ended up getting into the corporate world because like, hey, you try to start a business, doesn't work. You run out of money, like you need a job, right? A friend got me a job in an insurance company. Uh, and I kind of went from one job to the next. I ended up, uh, I, I didn't really like what I was doing, didn't know what I was going to do. I went back to school, got an MBA because... Uh, you know, I'm not fulfilled. Uh, what can I do? Uh, for me growing up, education was always the answer, right? My parents were educators. Uh, so I went back to school and got the MBA and that helped me immensely in building my network and, and turning and opening the world to new opportunities. And that eventually led to me getting into consulting. And I know you spent some time in consulting in the past as well. Um, I just kind of stumbled on this dream job thanks to an introduction from a friend of mine. And, uh, you know, I'm very big on networking and this is a story that, you know, for many of us who have leveraged networking in the past, you often have that person who helped set us up for success and kind of change the trajectory of our career. Uh, for me, it was a guy named Adam Boggs, who I reached out to about a possible career change, and he got me a job for this consulting company, which allowed me to start traveling all over the world, meeting people, running leadership development workshops, things like that. Um, the interesting thing was a few years into it, I had that feeling that you described. You know, I had uh, you know, on paper, everything's great, right? Six figure salary, uh, two kids. Actually, I think I had one and one more on the way. Uh, and, uh, you know, happy marriage, everything looks fine, but I feel inside like something is missing. Like this is just not, I can't do this for 30 more years or whatever it is. Like, it's just not going to work for me. I'm just not that happy with it. Even though I work for a great company with a great culture and all of that, and that is where, you know, I started exploring. I thought it was maybe I just needed to make more money and get to retirement faster, right? Some people start going down that avenue, like the Phi Avenue. And uh, that's when I discovered personal development. I heard a podcast interview uh, with Hal Elrod, who wrote the book, The Miracle Morning. And I immediately got his book and read it, devoured it, and started practicing The Miracle Morning, which is, you know, essentially, for those that don't know, get up an hour earlier than necessary and spend time in meditation and reading and writing um, and exercise and using affirmations, things that, you know, a lot of these things I hadn't done. Um, uh, I've been in exercise my whole life, but no meditation, I hadn't been reading that much, that sort of thing. So I really started to change my trajectory and I start reading a ton of books, listening to a lot of podcasts and, um, 
like really investigating what it is that I really want to do and and reconnecting with this idea of entrepreneurship and realizing that that's really what I want. And I never really enjoyed having a boss. Uh, and I really want to go try to run my own business, but I don't know how. So I'm starting to reach out and get help from people, right? I'm joining mastermind groups. I'm hiring coaches. I'm going to conferences, reading more books. Uh, this is so, so important when you figure out what that thing is that you want to achieve to go find some help, right? Whether it's a coach or an online course, books, podcasts, etc. cetera. Uh, don't try to do it on your own because there are answers out there. And in going through this journey, what I discovered that was truly missing for me was growth. I just wasn't growing, right? And what I've learned since then, uh, and I learned this from, from Tony Robbins going to one of his workshops, that all fulfillment essentially stems from growth and contribution. And if you don't feel like you're growing, then you're not going to have that fulfillment in your life. So are you growing and does your work matter? And I didn't have either of those. Um, eventually, I, you know, I went down this avenue and chased this idea of entrepreneurship and started to uh, make the move that way and built my own business and this career that I absolutely love and realized that there's an opportunity to help other people do this, but it doesn't have to be, you know, you and I talked about this before we started recording. It doesn't have to be entrepreneurship. Not everybody's cut out to be an entrepreneur, but I think everybody wants to feel that level of fulfillment and happiness in their career. And that's why I wrote my book to create like a guidebook to help other people achieve that and feel like they're more fulfilled in their career. No, oh, it's beautiful. When you were talking about getting into self-development and you said, Andy, you can't go it alone. It's, it's the irony, right? The mm. irony of self-development is it can't be done alone. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, whoa, yeah. self-development is not done completely on my own. That's wild. But it's yeah. the truth, right? If you're going to get yourself, you have to shock your system out of your conformity and your comfort zone. And you do that by having others excite you and pull you up and inspire you, whether yeah. they're dead, alive, written in person, whatever it is, right. expose yourself to those sources that make you want to be a better version of yourself. Yeah. And I think there's levels of that help, right? I think that you can get all the information you need by reading these books and listening to podcasts. And I've done that in some areas. Um, but at the same time, we live in a time where there's no shortage of information, right? We can learn how to do anything we want to do. Uh, the thing that separates those who are successful from those who, who aren't or those who achieve big things is implementation. Like, what do you do with that information? And sometimes we need higher levels of help. Like you can read the book and like, OK, that sounds good, but I still don't know how to do this. Let me hire a coach who can walk me through it or even hire somebody to do it for me. Uh, for example, I can go on YouTube and probably there's a video that will tell me how to fix just about anything on my car. But I'm not very, I don't see myself as very handy. I don't like digging in there. Uh, and so I'm not going to change, uh, you know, I'm not even going to change my own oil, let alone like a carburetor or something like that. I'd rather take it to a mechanic who knows how to do it. Right. Or if I really want to do it myself, have a friend who's really good with cars, you know, pay them or buy them a six pack of beer, right. And come over. I've had a friend offer to this who, cause I've got friends who love working on cars, right. To come over and do it with me to show me how to do it rather than me trying to spend years to try to figure out. It's the same thing in our careers, right? Whether you're trying to start a business um, or achieve some type of career goal, you're trying to get to vice president of marketing, right? Why not go network with people who have done that? Hire a coach who has experience in that field who can push you uh, on those things that you need to do. When I wanted to, I had the idea for my book and I knew I wanted to publish a book. I didn't try to do it all on my own. I hired a coach. I took an online course. I learned everything I needed to do and everything I needed about self-publishing a book. And then I followed all of their advice and I did it. And it's been, uh, you know, by, by many measures, like fairly successful because of that, because I reached out and I was willing to invest in my own development, in my own success and learn from other people and not try to do it all myself. I've gotten places a lot faster because of that. Yeah. The thread I want to highlight here on this, this little discussion point is what, what Andy's describing is that when you want something more for yourself, you have to be entrepreneurial. Mm. Now, I, I use that word very intentionally, right? Because it's about entrepreneurship means going from a, a state of low yield to high yield. If you look about the, the definition, it was, 
from a guy from France. And it's on you to ignite that. It doesn't mean you have to do it yourself. So whether you want a better career situation, job, lifestyle, relationship, whatever it is, you have to ignite that and figure out the resources to spin in motion with you so that it comes to life. And you have to be entrepreneurial. You can't just wait for it to be handed to you on a silver platter. So while I think you and I are in alignment that the great majority of people listening to this show, the great majority of people in this world should not leave a corporate nine to five environment because it's safe and stable. There are elements where you have to be extremely entrepreneurial for you to unlock the sort of life and career that you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's sort of the mindset. It's the approach of like, I'm going to get really clear on my vision. I'm going to set some goals. I'm going to make a plan and I'm going to take action towards that. Right. And I'm going to own it. I'm going to take full responsibility. So yeah, you can call it being entrepreneurial, right? Because when you're an entrepreneur, you run your business you like, obviously like we do rely on external factors, clients and mentors and providers and contractors and things like that. But it's ultimately our responsibility at the end of the day. You can't blame anybody else. You can't, um, you know, my boss screwed me over cause there is no boss. Right. So you think about it that way. Even if you do work in a company and you do have a boss, uh, stop being a victim, stop blaming other people, like take that full responsibility, take ownership. And I find when I do that, I, I feel a lot more fulfilled and I'm usually achieving a lot more as a result. Yeah. hundred percent. I want to dive into a few items, Andy, that in reading your book, it, it had some interesting questions that came up. Now, keep in mind, people listening to this, they likely say mid to late 30s, they've got a good track record of success. They've been in corporate America or some equivalent for some number of years, but they start to feel what you felt inside. You feel unfulfilled. Yep. You want something more from work. You want something more from life. You're not necessarily jumping out doing your own thing right now, but they're asking some deep questions. Now, as you read your book, straight on the cover and elsewhere, this word drifting came out. Yep. I saw that a lot. It was a theme. I'm curious why did you choose that word and what does it mean to you in this context? Yeah, so that was uh, inspired. I didn't make that up. Uh, it was inspired by a couple of places. One, uh, my friend Dominic Cortuccio, uh, I don't know if you've come across any of his work. He's got a couple of books and uh, on one of them is on living intentionally. And he, I interviewed him on my podcast years ago and he kind of introduced me to this idea of drift. Uh, but he didn't make that up either. Where he got it from was uh, the late, great Napoleon Hill, uh, who wrote a book called Outwitting the Devil. Now, everybody knows his famous work, Think and Grow Rich, which he wrote in the 1930s and I think is the most successful personal development book of all time. Uh, but he also and that's and that work came from interviewing uh, tons of very successful people and sort of distilling what those best practices were. And that was one of the first personal development books I read. Uh, and it was interesting because I remember reading. Uh, he's the one that coined the term mastermind group. And he talked about these titans of industry being in a mastermind. And I was like, I need that. How the heck do you find a mastermind group? Um, now I feel like they're everywhere, but it's also because I've gotten so into the entrepreneurial personal development community world, following a lot of people. A lot of people have uh, mastermind groups that you can join. Uh, and I've been in groups and paid communities for the last six years and, and give a lot of credit to those groups for my own success and my journey uh, because I've been able to get help and also build a network and connect with a lot of other great people. Uh, during that time, he also talked to a lot of people who were unsuccessful, who were not doing well. And he wrote this book called Outwitting the Devil, which is like a uh, he never says whether it's fictional or nonfiction conversation between himself and the devil about how the devil takes over people's minds. And uh, Matt, I think you referenced this in the the document you sent me before. I don't know if you had a chance to read the book or not. It's very interesting. Um, but his wife deemed it would too controversial, made him promise not to publish it. He never did. Uh, and then it got published many, many years later, I think in the early 2000s, long after he was gone. Uh, and I'm glad it was because it is an interesting read. And it's the idea that, you know, whether you believe in the devil or not, um, that people generally are, are drifting through life when they are operating in reaction mode. They're waiting for other people to tell them what to do or, or where to go. They are uh, sort of living by whatever they think society deems they should be doing, uh, you know, drinking, smoking, watching sports. Uh, they're not really working towards any type of concrete goal or anything worthwhile. Um, the list kind of goes on and on. Um, I've boiled it down to, and the way it serves my topic and my book is the idea of people being reactionary and waiting for others to tell them what to do uh, versus those who are living life with intention and working towards something worthwhile, right? We talked about 
uh, really getting clear on that vision and goal of what you want to achieve, putting a, a plan in place and taking action on a regular basis. I mean, challenges are going to come up. It's not always going to work out perfectly. Um, but again, I think it's a lot more fulfilling to take ownership and to be working on something versus waiting for someone else right? Like many of us have done. I mean, I was there in my twenties. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And I was sort of waiting for something to kind of, you know, come to me. Uh, and it never really did until I went out there and got it. And, you know, there are a lot of intricacies in that too, as well. And I don't know where you were on this, Matt, but I spent a lot of time in my twenties watching sports, like way, way, way too much time. And, um, I have no judgment for anybody for how they want to live their life. But what I realized is that we're talking thousands of hours that really amounted to nothing um, when I could have been possibly using that to work, you know, work towards something worthwhile. And so now I've cut, you know, most sports and things like that out of my life. I think it, there's, there's a time and place, right? Like it's okay to relax. And, and uh, I, again, I don't begrudge anybody for how they spend their time. Uh, it's just sort of like getting more mindful about how and where you're spending your time. And are you making progress towards something and being honest with yourself as well? Uh, you know, hear a lot of people say like, oh, I'd love to, you know, go to the gym or get in better shape or uh, go out for this promotion. I just don't really have that much time. And uh, I often wonder, like, do you? Because we all have the same amount of time, right? It's just a matter of where you're spending it, what your priorities are. Yeah. Find those places of meaningful leverage in life and start pulling those levers versus the ones that aren't doing anything for you. Mm -hmm. So I love the idea of drifting. Uh, one quote from that book that I pulled up, it, he describes, uh, Napoleon Hill describes a drifter as, he will lack enthusiasm and initiative to begin anything he is not forced to undertake. I was like, mm. yep, that's a lot of people, right? Where you plug into a system, you wait to be told what to do, and you say yes to whatever you're asked to do too. You don't have agency. You no longer exert your preferences, how you yes. show up, the type of work you do. You just plug in and be like, well, they're paying my salary. Therefore, I should mm -hmm. do everything that's generally accepted. Go to all the meetings, say yes to everything. And just like, wow, then your life gets taken over. You're no longer owning your life. Yes, that's difficult. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's say the counterweight to drifting, and you've mentioned this term a few times, would be professional development, a big theme in your book too, right? Professional development, I think, at least in my mind, that concept has changed. There's a lot that's underneath that term. Whereas before, I think you'd go point to more traditional credentials, degrees, masters, certificates, things like that. Given we're in 2022 recording this right now, we're kind of exiting COVID, we're all remote, everything's digital, everything. How should this modern professional think of professional development these days? Yeah. So, I mean, I see kind of the opposite of drifting is, is being intentional, right? And, and like working towards something worthy, like we talked about. And uh, one of the elements, so in my book, uh, you know, the first third of it is about taking ownership of your career, setting the vision, the goals, the plan, asking for help, taking responsibility. Uh, the second part is about preparing for the future and setting yourself up for future success, because you can set this goal and this plan, uh, but you really have no idea what might be coming, right? Like 2020 taught us all a lesson. Like we have no freaking clue what might be coming next. Um, all we can do is do the right things to set ourselves up for future success. And one of those things is investing in continuous learning. I don't think, you know, the, the days of, uh, you know, getting that college degree or master's degree and working in a field for 40 years without any further education, uh, like maybe our parents did, I think those days are over, right? The, the world is changing fast. Um, something I heard a long time ago that I've held on to is that the pace of change is today is faster than it's ever been before. And yet it's slower today than it's ever going to be, right? So things are just going to continue to speed up and get faster. You look at what's going on with technology and Web3 and like, it's just a lot of crazy stuff, right? And we've got to try to keep up, right? So that's where continuous learning comes in. Now, you can... Uh, invest in learning however you like, because there are so many different avenues. Like you said, we're in 2022. You know, we've talked about some of them. You've got books, you've got podcasts, you've got, uh, you know, LinkedIn, you've got online courses, you've got um, audio books, you've got, uh, you know, formal education, of course, you've got YouTube, um, you've got all kinds of places you can go uh, to be learning. You know, there's no, there's no shortage, right? And there's no um, there's really nothing holding us back other than maybe time research, you know, resources, some of those things cost money. Um, and then what are you going to do with those? The problem for a lot of people is not access, right? There's no lack of access. It's making time for those things because learning I see as an activity that falls in the bucket of important, but not urgent, right? So 
um, in my book, I, I grabbed this, uh, something called the Eisenhower matrix that was supposedly created by president Dwight D Eisenhower in the 1950s. It was, uh, made more popular by Stephen R. Covey in his book, uh, seven habits for highly effective people. Uh, and he said, he basically a two by two matrix, right? You got things rated by their level of importance. And then on the other axis is urgency. And what they've said is like, we spend most of our time reacting to more urgent things, whether they're important or not. So you get to keep getting that email, you get those social media notifications, you get that text from your boss or your spouse. Like there's always things to react to and things to do. Um, but the important things tend to be not as urgent and they keep getting put off. Right. And one of those things might be reading a book, getting a certification, taking an online course, right. Um, learning a new skill and they keep getting put off and put off and put off until one day you've become redundant at work because you never learned those new skills. Right. So I'm a big advocate of like focusing on the important things, even if they're not urgent and building in time for those things. Right. So whether you schedule it, uh, you know, I'm going to say, Wednesdays from three to five is my professional development time. I'm blocking that. I'm not taking meetings and I'm going to be reading a book or taking this online course. Uh, or uh, you do what I do, which is like early mornings is my time. I read every morning for, you know, 15 or 20 minutes. And, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot of time, but in doing that six, seven days a week, I read 25 to 30 books a year and I'm able to keep up on a lot of things. I also have lots of podcasts that are always, you know, queued up for my walks. I'm on LinkedIn every day. Like there's just a lot of great places to go. And I just believe in always being learning. And then, you know, the next thing you can do that's related <clears throat> to set, your up, set yourself up for future success is building your network. And in building a network, a strong network, especially in areas that you work in or want to work in uh, and having regular conversations with people, you can learn what they're working on, what they care about, what they're struggling with. And you can learn a ton from other people as well. It just comes down to, you know, your own learning style. Mm hmm. Yeah, I love that. There's the very real challenge. And I'm glad you brought up the Eisenhower matrix when we've got urgency and we have importance. And we keep saying, we keep hearing this all the time. I used to be this way. I said this. So do many of my clients is I don't have time, right? I don't have time to your point. We all have the same 24 seven. Okay. Yeah. Yes. We all have messy, chaotic lives, especially those with yeah. families, right? It's messy and chaotic. Okay. So what? What are you going to right. do about it? How are you going to carve that out? How are you going to install discipline and habits? And that sounds so one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we're going to start talking about atomic habits, Andy. Like, okay, <laughs> well, like, no, no, let's no BS. This is where it happens, right? Yeah. You start with 15 minutes of reading a day. That compounds right. in the 30. Next thing you know, you've carved out more time. You figure out how to go to bed earlier. You go to bed with your top three documented for the next day. So you don't have that decision fatigue the next day. This stuff gets better and tighter and get faster and faster. And the flywheel yeah. goes and goes. Instead mm -hmm. of just complaining about my life is just too complex. Why even start? Yeah. Let, let's right. not go there. Start tiny. Start yeah. atomic. And I got to watch the latest game. I got to keep up with the latest show, right? There's, you know, there's a lot of demands, a lot of things. But you get to choose how you spend your time. Life is trade-offs. On this concept of being intentional and professional development, I just would love your take on this. You had part of this in your book. Um, but the idea, again, for people in corporate that work in nine to fives, they they feel a little bit of pressure to just stay focused there. And yet they feel this pull to say, go build your personal brands, go build your personal brands. Mm -hmm. Yet they, a lot of people feel I can't do that in my, in my language, I'd say they feel caged. They, yeah. they tell themselves they cannot do something with that. They're not allowed They get their mm -hmm. hands slapped. What mm -hmm. would advice would you give to someone like that? Man, I, I am so I am excited and passionate about this topic of building a personal brand. I think for a while it was mostly in the realm of entrepreneurs. Like if you're building a business, you need to be building a personal brand, uh, right? Because in this new world we live in on social media, no matter what kind of business you're in, uh, you know, it's going to come down to your brand to attract potential clients. But I think in the corporate world, it's now just as important to be building your personal brand. And that's actually the third thing in my book where I talked about, uh, you know, the important things to do to set yourself up for future success. Success. Number one, invest in continuous learning. Number two, build your network. We all know is important. Uh, number three, build your personal brand. And what is your personal brand? It's nothing more than your reputation, right? It's what people think about you. They say about you when you're not in the room. And you think about when you are going out for a new job. Uh, you're applying for a role inside your company or a job outside of your company. You're going for a promotion. Uh, maybe in some ideal world, it comes down to just your experience and your skills. But we all know that there are more factors than that, right? And it's going to come down to your brand. It's going to come down to people ha having that conversation going, you know, yeah, Matt is, he's got a lot of experience, but like, he's kind of a jerk. I don't really want to work with him, right? I'm, I don't want to bring him onto this team. You know, that's part of your, you know, could be part of your brand or like, 
Matt is, you know, maybe he doesn't have as much experience as somebody else, but he just seems so in- eager, so enthusiastic, so curious. Like we know he's going to step in and learn this stuff. Let's bring him on, right? That's part of your brand. So you are impacting your brand every day with how you show up and how you interact with other people. Like it's very natural, a natural psychological phenomenon that we are always making these sort of micro judgments when we interact with people, when we see people, right? And those micro judgments are forming that reputation or that brand. And so I just feel like we might as well be intentional with that brand. It doesn't mean I want anybody to be fake. I'm a big fan of authenticity, right? Be yourself. Um, but I think we can be mindful about our brand and how we're showing up. And that's going to be impacted by uh, how we treat other people, how we interact with other people, how hard we work, how we do things. Um, and, you know, whether we're kind and we're collaborative or we're not, we're the opposite, whatever it may be. Uh, and how knowledgeable we are, the type of work we came on, you know, come on, how often we speak up in meetings, all that stuff uh, adds up to building that brand. And that brand can be attractive or not to people later on for jobs you're going out for. And now that's the internal side. And then on the external side, you're building your brand on social media online, right? That's where the, the world is. Uh, if you're in the corporate world, LinkedIn, I think is the place to be. But, you know, obviously you could be on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, um, you name it, and you could be building a brand there in sharing content and how you connect and interact with other people, commenting on other people's content. Um, you know, Matt, you have uh, commented on some of my posts recently on LinkedIn and supported me. And I noticed that, right? I'm like, oh, Matt is a supportive person. Like he he likes the content. He obviously resonates with it. Uh, and that kind of goes in the back of my mind, right? And that stuff can build over time. You could connect with those thought leaders you follow and admire and you keep supporting them and supporting them. Uh, you know, they just might notice you and it helps to build your brand and who knows what that might lead to later on? Uh, I just think this brand is going to become more and more important as we get into more of a gig type economy and there's different type of opportunities out there. Um, I think a lot of companies are going to come around to it as well and start to realize that like, oh, if our we let our leaders encourage our leaders to go build brands, that could be attractive to other great employees out there in the marketplace that might want to come work for them. So they'll shift from, oh, we don't want you posting on LinkedIn to hey, could you spend some time on LinkedIn, right? Building your brand there because we want more of a presence from our company. And we noticed that nobody follows company pages, right? They follow people, right? They want to follow people exactly. because we are humans. We like connecting with other humans. So well said. Oh God, you just hit my sentiments very, very well there. <laughs> it's the whole idea with, with the personal brand. You have one, whether you like it or not. And you're saying this, yeah. right? So it's not like you don't want that. You have one. It's just your reputation. Yeah. And if you think about it in this modern world, to push it both internal and external to where you work, it's merely you digitizing your reputation and putting it out there for people to notice at scale. And that only opens doors. It opens doors and it pushes you to grow. Because when you do things like building in public, shipping posts, videos, whatever mm -hmm. it is, you are growing new muscles, you're facing fears, you're engaging with thought leaders, you are challenging yourself outside of your comfort zone, which is your nine to five, which you're very comfortable in and most of the time, right? Right. So I love that you said that. Yeah. And let me just add the exercise because a lot of people are asking like, how, what do I do with this? And what I've landed on with this is that you spend some time in self-reflection, which is really important. And uh, you know this, Matt, most people in the corporate world, they never stop and take time to actually think, right? To reflect, uh, spend some time in self-reflection and ask yourself, you know, first and foremost, what's your vision? Where do you want to go? What are your values? What are the things that are important to you? Um, you know, what do you want to change and do in your career? Uh, but also, what do you want your brand to stand for? If you pick like three or four adjectives or attributes, whether it's um, integrity or hard work or getting things done or inspiration, education, thought leader, or whatever, like what do you want to be known for? What do you want your brand to stand for? And then you can ask yourself, write those down. You can ask yourself on a regular basis, am I living in alignment with that brand? Am I showing up in alignment with that brand, right? So for example, I want my brand to stand for uh, kindness, generosity, inspiration, motivation, uh, health, that sort of stuff. And I can ask myself regularly, am I showing up with that? Did I bring energy and enthusiasm to that podcast interview? Did I hopefully teach and inspire a couple of people to think about owning their careers? Have I been kind and generous to other people? Am I showing up that way in real life and on social media? And very important, right? Because uh, we see those people that just show up one way on social media and we know like they're full of crap. Uh, I'm not a fan of that, right? Like you've got to live both ways and, and, and be your true self. Um, but we can check in with ourselves and be mindful about you know, am I showing up in alignment with my brand?
Yeah, great points there. Really applicable. That's the point, right? We need to find ways to apply this rather than just study it. So Andy, I'd like to pivot a little bit. You had something very unforeseen occur during COVID. And I found this by going to your website. I noticed that you had cancer. And it was, as you were getting your book out the door, you learned a lot. I saw the way you talk, documented it. You had this great document on how to think about it, how to approach it, and your experience. It was beautiful. I, I took that in. I listened to some of the podcasts. I want to thank you for creating that. There's a lot mm. of people in this world that can benefit from it. On that note, I'd love to just hear a few reflections from you. How did that experience of going through that change you? Yeah. So uh, in November 2020, I was uh, set to publish my book and I started experiencing a lot of uh, abdominal pain. And I ended up going to a couple of different doctors and, and found out I had testicular cancer and that I needed to have surgery to remove my testicle and all this stuff, uh, which I did. I had surgery uh, two days after I published my book in November 2020. Uh, and then uh, the hope was that, you know, that would catch it early enough and I wouldn't need to do anything after that. But unfortunately, the, the cancer had spread to my stomach and my neck. And I ended up going through, um, some chemotherapy and, and other treatment. I also, during that time, uh, took, did a ton of research on, uh, health and nutrition and cancer and, uh, how I can potentially try to beat this naturally, right? Cause I was looking for natural alternatives. And, um, the thing I really learned so I had been doing a lot of work on mindset leading up to that, right? I didn't know what I was training for, but I had already written this chapter on mindset. I had developed this growth mindset, this ownership mindset, um, this, I'd been studying and reading stoicism for many years, right? And so when that moment came where the doctor says, you know, you have cancer, you need to have surgery, of course it was like, ah, this sucks, right? But instead of being like devastated by it, it you know, I chose to see it more as a challenge. Um, if anything else, I was really frustrated because I was about to publish a book and I had these big aspirations and I'm like, I'm going to build a business around this book. I've already dealt with COVID, which by the way, shut down my entire business. Uh, all my clients went away. I was writing my book at the time thinking I'm going to be a speaker. And then COVID comes and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be a speaker because <laughs> there's not going to be any events to speak at. Right. Um, that whole industry died. My whole business at the time was running in-person training programs. I was traveling around running leadership development workshops. My whole business went away. I pivoted that business. I started a new business. I made the same amount of money that year. I was really proud of myself. I was publishing this book and I'm about to go out and grow a business around it. And now I've got this new challenge that I get to deal with. And, uh, you know, I wasn't excited about it, but I felt like this is, this is what I get to deal with right now. This is the challenge that I have and I'm going to deal with the best I can. And I'm going to share with others. And I'm very lucky that I have help, right? I'm, I'm married. I have a wife. My mom is local and she's very helpful. Um, I have a, just a big network and lots and lots of great friends. Uh, so I'm a very, very fortunate position compared to others, not to mention access to amazing healthcare uh, here in the United States. And so I'm going to make the most of it, but I, you know, I put everything else on hold. I started doing research uh, on all these different things I could be doing and started putting a lot of those things into place, changing my diet, um, juicing, um, taking a lot of different supplements, um, investing money in alternative treatments, as well as uh, doing the chemotherapy. And all the while I'm, I'm sharing this, you know, journey out on social media because uh, one, I have a lot of friends I know who are interested as I would be in them. Um, and two, I know a lot of people are dealing with different challenges, right? And this is one that I get to deal with. And maybe I can provide some perspective that can help other people. And I learned that, uh, you know, we're all going to face big challenges and mindset plays a big role in how we overcome those challenges, right? There are some things that are out of our control, but our mindset is within our control and, and how we tackle that. And um, I wanted to really tackle it intentionally to really take ownership of that and show that I, you know, sort of practice what I preach. Uh, a couple of things I did that were really helpful in addition to all the diet and everything else was uh, number one, you know, I continue to, to meditate every day to stay mindful and try to like give peace to my mind. Um, but a couple other things, number one was to focus on gratitude every single day. And I'm, I'm big on this. I, I know you probably are as well um, that, you know, no matter where we are, what we have going on, we have things that we can be grateful for. And I wrote down my gratitude every single day for what I had, even on the worst, worst days, because I still had things to be grateful for my family, great healthcare, uh, you know, food in front of me, that sort of stuff. Um, and then I also remember this, this idea of nature of impermanence, which I originally learned, you know, through the mind, mindful work that I've been doing mindfulness work. Um, but also like, right as I was going into it, I happened to have a conversation with my friend, Lauren Davis, who has a tattoo that says, this is how it is right now. 
And I would remember that and I would recite that every day that this is how it is right now on the hardest days. I know it's hard now, but it's not going to last forever. And it's crazy to think that, you know, it's been more than a year and uh, I'm completely healthy today. Um, I'm back in the gym six days a week, uh, built, growing my business, living my life normally with only some very small sort of consequences of going through the chemotherapy that don't really affect my life that much. And it's kind of all in the rearview mirror now. Um, the great thing is that I get to use this to now teach and help other people, right? I've been through this challenge. And as you said, I created the document because I know other people are going to go through cancer. It's just a fact, like millions of people in the United States are going to be dealing with this. And I want to be able to help. And I strongly believe that we go through our challenges in life so that we are qualified to help other people, right? Whether that's death in the family, divorce, health challenges, um, you know, disabilities, whatever it is, if we choose to see those as qualifications to then help other people who are going to come after us because there will be others. Um, the other really important thing in there is with mindset is language. So I wrote about this in my book and it really put it to the test is that I choose to believe this is part of having an ownership mindset. I choose to believe that everything in life happens for me and not to me. And that even includes really hard things like cancer. I do believe that that was a blessing, that it did happen for me because it now allows me to help other people um, and that it's something that I get to go through, not that I have to go through. And when we change our language um, to things in life having for us instead of to us, it can really do a mindset shift that can really help us uh, turn challenges and opportunities and, and overcome anything in life. And so I just knew I had an opportunity, you know, maybe it was there so that I can go through this and show other people how to handle hard things. Um, and, uh, that hopefully that will help other people, which is kind of part of what life is all about. Oh man. I love that. Oh, a few things come to mind. It's when you're talking about programming your mind, Descartes had it wrong, right? Mind body are not disconnected. They are mm. one. There's physiological effects of pro and I could see this. Maybe you can comment on this. I could see this as you were talking about your approach for healing and curing yourself was that you saw the power of mind to affect the body. So you're programming thoughts so that your body would listen and would heal. So I mean, I, my dad, I lost him to cancer. And I, mm. I remember reading those books in a hurry. It was too late at that point. But I yeah. saw the power of that. And I couldn't help but think that your journey in a professional sense where you said, I can't, I can't deal with this conformity anymore. I can't deal with falling in line and just doing the same thing that everyone else is doing and following yeah. this default path. You have yeah. this rebellious spirit in you yeah. clearly, and it's benefited you. It just felt like you applied that inherently naturally to yeah. your own journey in cancer. Cause you know, just accepting the default prescriptions from doctors mm -hmm. is not something you could wrestle with. Cause that means average and average yeah. does not mean you creating an exceptional outcome. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there was a moment where I asked my oncologist, and she was, she was wonderful. Um, but I asked her like, am I your do most difficult patient? Because I would challenge her on everything. I'd ask questions. I bring research to the table. What about this? Um, and she was very honest. Well, I don't know anything about that. All I know is chemo, but she had an open mind about things. That's why I say she, she's, she was wonderful. There's a lot worse doctors out there. Um, but I'm a big advocate of, you know, you got to take ownership of your situation, no matter what's going on in life. And, uh, don't just rely on other people, like, including doctors. I mean, they, have your best interest in mind, but they might have differing, different, um, uh, goals or incentives that, you know, might be different from yours. For instance, uh, they, they see cancer, they want to use chemo or radiation, not really thinking about the long-term ramifications. They don't have to live with those, right? Chemo is highly toxic, uh, you know, chemicals that, that I've put in my body. And, uh, we don't have to go down that rabbit hole and talk about healthcare or whatever, but like, yeah. it's really about taking ownership and having that mindset. And, and that means even sometimes bucking against, what other people think you should be doing the trends, right? Even if it's going back as simple as uh, all your friends are getting together to watch the, you know, the NBA finals or uh, you know, sports. And you're like, well, actually I have this other project that I want to work on and I'm, I'm going to skip out on that. I feel bad, but there's this, you know, sometimes you got to rebel, <laughs> I guess. I love it. I love it. it. It shows up in a big way in, in treating cancer, man. Beautiful yeah. story. Thanks for sharing Andy. For sure. A few questions to wrap oh, us actually, up. Sorry, can I just jump in on that real quick? No, uh, if, if anybody listening is going through cancer, you have a loved one going through cancer. I did create a document uh, laying out all of my experience and my research and my advice. 
uh, which Matt mentioned. And you can go grab that by going to my website, which is andystorch.com slash cancer. You just put in your email address and you can download it for free. I'm not selling anything. I just want to help people. So andystorch.com slash cancer. Great. We'll put that in the show notes too. Thank you, Andy. So a few wrap up questions for you. Ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right. What is one big limiting belief that knowledge workers are facing today? Uh, I think <laughs> I think it's ironic if you call them knowledge workers. I think a lot of people have limiting beliefs that their knowledge is actually worth anything, right? Um, it's sort of you call it imposter syndrome or you know whatever it is that like oh if I know something probably everybody else knows it or maybe they don't care uh, that that belief that most people don't care what I have to say. And, uh, I used to have that when I started down this journey and I started building my brand and I started putting content out there and I started thinking, well, like, am I just saying stuff that people already know they don't care? And then people keep saying like, oh, I'm so glad you put that out there. I really appreciate it. Like keep going. Right. So when other people are encouraging you, listen to them, don't fight against that. Right. Because that's reinforcing that you need to be sharing your gifts with the world. Beautiful. If you were starting your career right now, what advice would you give yourself? Well, I wrote my book for that. So um, <laughs> um, my advice would be, uh, number one, follow your curiosity, like 100%, whatever you're curious about, go pursue that. Number two, you know, set a clear vision for what you want to do with it, set some goals and always be like taking action towards it. And number three, don't be afraid to invest in yourself, like go out and get help, invest in you know, books, courses, coaches, mastermind groups, whatever it may be, uh, invest in yourself before you even invest in stock market or retirement, because it's going to pay off so much in the long term. The greatest asset is yourself. hundred yeah. percent. Andy, what does uncaged mean to you? Oh, I love that brand. I, you know, I haven't ever thought of it that way. Um, but I, <laughs> I don't like rules and I don't like having a boss. And I obviously, like you said, that kind of rebellious streak. I didn't discover that till later in life. I didn't know what was bothering me. Um, I love this idea of freedom. It's definitely one of my values, my core values. And um, I don't think everybody has to be that way. It's totally fine to to work in a company and, and have and follow rules and have a boss. And hopefully you have a great manager who cares about you. Um, but I think uncaged means that you're not letting things in life hold you back. You're not letting those limiting beliefs hold you back. You're not letting other people and society hold you back from doing the things that you want to do and achieving the things that you want to achieve. Like you have big dreams and you're not sitting there going, well, I'd love to do X, um, but I can't because of these things over here. And like, you know, sometimes they're realistic, right? Like when I was growing up, my dream is to be a professional baseball player. I'm now 42 years old. Like that dream is gone. That's, there's no way that's happening. Right. But I am coaching my daughter's softball team, so I'm still out on the field, right? Um, so you can find different ways to get out there and be involved. But but seriously, like a lot of times people have these dreams. I want to start a business. I want to become a director, but this one thing is holding me back. Like find the thing that you can do to move forward. Take ownership of that situation. And, um, you know, don't let the cage, don't let society, don't let other people's opinions of you, don't let those things hold you back that you are pursuing something big and you are not letting anybody else stop you. Hell yes. I love that. It, by the way, I am with you on that baseball dream. I still am there. I'm a little <laughs> league coach for my yeah. son and just like, at least we get to have it in our own way right? to live vicariously through them a little bit. Right. Oh my gosh. Last, I was assistant coach last season and like the whole season was fine. It was fun being out there. But then at the end of the season, the league, they did a coaches softball game. And that was the highlight of this year. Cause I actually got to play. <laughs> oh man. Living the dream, living the, living dream. the dream. Exactly. <sighs> Andy, where can people connect with you online and how can you help them? Uh, well, you know, Matt, I'm all over the place. Um, you know, my website, andystorch.com has everything right there. Uh, if you go to andystorch.com slash career uh, and click on bonus resources, you can get access to uh, my five steps to owning your career, uh, my morning routine, uh, the five most common career mistakes that people make, the three questions to ask anytime you face a big challenge in your life. Uh, all those are on the bonus resources on my website. Uh, I'm very active on LinkedIn, as you know, as well as Instagram. And uh, my book is called Own Your Career, Own Your Life. 
It's available on Amazon. I've got a couple of podcasts as well. The Own Your Career podcast. I think they say you're not supposed to give people multiple things. Just go to andystores.com. Everything's right there. <laughs> you made it a nice central hub. Your digitized reputation is easily searchable right there. Man, Just it's always a it. work. In, it's always a work in progress, though. It's always a work in progress. And, uh, and, and by the way, you know, final note for people: you are you're pursuing big goals. Nothing needs to be perfect. Perfection is a myth. Progress over perfection all day long, every day. Just take action towards something. Your website looks like crap. Who cares? Just keep going. Keep talking to people. Build your network. You never know where it's going to go. As my coach would say, always just take aligned, messy action day after day. That's it. (laughs) Andy, what closing message would you want to leave with the audience today? (sighs) Closing message is that nobody cares more about your career than you do. Uh, Hopefully, your parents are still around and they love you and care about you. Hopefully if you work in corporate, you have a boss who cares about you and um, takes time to meet with you on a regular basis. But honestly, at the end of the day, nobody cares about more about your career than you do. So you've got to be the one to get clear on that vision for where you want to go to make a plan, to set goals, to ask for help, to invest in yourself, to take action on a regular basis, to build your network, to build your brand, to get your mindset in order, all the things that we talked about today. You've got to be the one to take ownership, to take responsibility, and to take action. And if you do, things may not work out perfectly. You might run into challenges, um, but you'll be very, very happy you did, and uh, you will not regret that decision. Uh, Beautiful way to sum it up, man. Andy, stepping back, I mean, we talked about some big themes today, ownership, that whole idea from the book and the threads of our conversations. When you take extreme ownership of your own career and life, magical things happen because it's not going to be handed to you. You care inherently about your life and career more than anyone else will. Second, I hear about listening to your inner voice. There were some things that are always speaking to you and you displayed how you listened to that and you took action with that. We all have an inner voice. We all have these little intuitions, like pay attention to those signals. You're, you have pain in your arm for a reason. You, you don't like Monday mornings for a reason. Pay attention to those signals because it's pointing you. It's like a compass pointing you somewhere else. Okay. And then just damn, take some action, little tiny messy actions day after day. Do not wait. I had this great saying I heard on Twitter the other day, which was life lesson. Do not wait. Prices always increase. I was like, oh, that is so good. The Mm. price, the costs you incur always increase when you wait, whatever that is, whether it's in jobs, whether it's waiting to make an investment, whatever it is. So I love that. Andy, thanks for the time today. This is really wonderful. Matt, I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on. It was my pleasure. All right, man. Can't wait to get this to the world. We'll chat soon. Hey, Matt here. Thanks for listening to Uncage Yourself. For show notes and more content like this, head over to uncageyourself.fm. And if you liked what you heard, I'd appreciate you leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Until next time, be well, my friend.